Good morning. We are here with three excellent women's basketball coaches um, just to talk just some, some hot topics around the country right now and all the conferences and a um, little, little bit different experiences uh, for these, each of these three individuals. So I'm going to let them just introduce themselves and tell kind of where they are and how long they've been coaching. Go ahead, Molly. My name is Molly Miller. Um, I'm coaching at my alma mater at Drury University in Springfield, Missouri. I've been coaching for nine years and going into my sixth season as the head coach there. My name is Jonas Chatterton. I'm currently at Oregon State University. I'm the associate head coach. I've been there the last five years um, and prior to that, University of Colorado Boulder and Brigham Young University. My name is Tina Martin and currently I'm an assistant at UNCW, but I've also been a head coach for over 21 years and an assistant coach for over 10. Excellent. And I'm Katie Young-Stout. I'm with Ventura Partners. Uh, we are an executive search firm specializing in um, coach searches of all kinds, everything from fencing to basketball, football, um, and athletic director searches and WDADs as well. A lot of administrators um, are our clients. So uh, just want to kick it off really quick just by prefacing this, uh, this brief uh, interview. Um, women's basketball uh, roundtable here. So let's talk a little bit about just one of the hottest topics right now. I know Muffet McGraw, head coach at Notre Dame, uh, made a comment, uh, a statement actually, after the NCAA tournament, that there are too many men, and I'm not going to put you on the spot here, Jonas, but too many men being hired to coach women's basketball, um, you know, that she would never hire a male on her staff. So that's kind of what we want to talk about, just some different things, different nuances of that subject right now on Athletic Director University. So let's just start off by, you know, talking about are there too many men coaching women? I mean, um, I don't want to put you on the spot here, Jonas, but I would love to hear your thoughts as a male in a women's, you know, basketball industry and how do we come to a point where there's so many male head coaches on the women's side? And I know you're an assistant, so have you tried to become a head coach? I mean, tell sure. us about some of your challenges. Sure, I, uh, I would love to be a head coach and I've had uh, looked at opportunities throughout the years. And I think <clears throat> my take on Muffet's uh, comments were that I think she would like more opportunities for women moving forward. And so I think that as our game grows and this goes across the board, I think socially, that uh, <clears throat> has more opportunities for women and creating more opportunities for women is a good thing. I, um, I got in women's basketball to promote leadership and develop young women, and so I want those opportunities as well. I have daughters and my, myself, so you want to see women have potential to, to fill those roles and to do those things. Uh, with that, I think there's also a curve of being ready um, and being uh, in a position to be successful when you get those opportunities. And I think that there's been some opportunities throughout the years for men to come into the women's side of coaching basketball that provide great knowledge and, and is leadership as well for young women. And uh, to have a male role model is not a, a, a bad thing for a young lady. <clears throat> and so those opportunities need to grow, I think, for young women, for diversity and people of color across our country in all social aspects, not just in coaching basketball, but it starts, and I think her comments start with coaching women's basketball. Um, I think that as that happens, there needs to be uh, more structure and more um, development of young women's coaches to be ready for those positions. Well said. Um, Tina, I'd love to get your thoughts on, um, you, have you had male assistants? And what do you think that the difference is bringing, you know, what do they bring to the table that sometimes, you know, assistants that are women don't bring? Or maybe there's just that diversity piece where you've got, you know, just some different perspective. Um, tell us a little bit about that. What's the value in having, you know, men on, when you're on your staff? Well, first of all, I think that there's a, a lot of value in having a, a male on your staff. And I've always had a male on my staff as a head coach. Um, and I think it's, something that helps your student athletes because every student athlete relates um, to different types of individuals, both male and female. I really don't look at it as a male and female gender issue. I look at it more as an opportunity who is qualified. Um, when I was coaching for two decades I, as a head coach, I looked at the qualifications of the applicant and I really felt it was very important that that individual had the qualifications to mentor and show leadership qualities and you know, to, to really help these individuals be well-rounded. Um, I think it's really important that we prepare student athletes for life. 
and they're not just going to see female role models, they're going to see male role models and they're going to interact um, obviously with male coaches as well as female coaches. So we're preparing them for life um, in, in general and I, so I think yes, it's very important to have a, a male on your staff. That being said, I think it's the individual coach's responsibility to decide what's important to them. You know, um, obviously Muffet feels very strongly about this issue and she has spoken out about it. And for her, that's what she feels is best on her staff and will help her be successful. So the bottom line is it comes down to an individual basis. It comes down to, you know, making a decision as to what your staff is going to look like, whether it's diversity, whether it's male, whether it's female, um, and then what are their qualifications and, and what can they bring to the table to make you better as a head coach. So those are the things that I would look at. So Molly, I would, I would love to hear from your perspective just now as a head coach and then also as a former player at your alma mater, um, what, what style you know, of coaching did you kind of come up in the game with and how do you feel now that that is you know, transitioned into being a head coach? How, does, how do you feel now about you know, your thoughts on, uh, on male coaches in women's basketball? So when I played, I, I think back to some of the best coaches I ever had and one was my dad growing up. And I'm like, well, why didn't my mom coach me? Why, why was my dad my coach? And um, 1972, Title IX passed. That wasn't until my mom's senior year. So my, my thought is, um, I agree, that the opportunity just hasn't been there in the past. So when you're looking at hiring um, and, and who the pool of candidates for, I just think there's been, you know, my dad played the game. He talked to the male mentors in the field. He played the game and played the game and played the game and loved the game. My mom didn't have the opportunity to gain all that knowledge and play the game and learn from mentors and, and role models because there, there weren't female athletes, let alone female coaches. So I think the needle's moving in that direction of opportunity, but um, it's hard for me to justify taking away a great pool of candidates that are extremely qualified, extremely knowledgeable. I've had all female staffs, I've had a male on my staff, I've played for male coaches, I've played for female coaches. I've got a little two and a half year old and, and God willing she'll play basketball and fall in love with it. Uh, she's in the 20th percentile, so I think my dreams of a 6'1 point guard are uh, doused, but uh, I just want her to play for a good coach, a great human being that just wants to um, th get her far in life and mentor her and coach her, and uh, that's what I want for my players too. So just putting them in front of good people, um, regardless of gender, with great expertise and uh, you know, just a great role model I think is an extremely important. Awesome. And you mentioned a little bit about the paradigm shift, a little bit, the, you know, the moving the needle over. Um, and that kind of brings me to my next topic. Um, what do you think it'll take to see more women coaching on the men's side? We see that now in the NBA. You know, we've got uh, Becky down at San Antonio coaching. The Mavericks have an assistant coach who is a woman. Um, you know, more front office in the NBA. They're hiring women as player development coaches in Philly. Um, you know, different, different individuals. I saw yesterday uh, New Orleans Pelicans just hired a woman as, uh, in the front office as well. So it seems like it, the, the needle's moving, right? So we're getting more opportunities as women to, uh, to step into that, to that role. But um, on the women's basketball side specifically, how do you see that NBA trend shifting over um, and women coaching men? It's, it's phenomenal model behavior, right? Someone's got to model it for it to kind of catch fire, if you will. Um, normal is comfortable. Anything outside normal is a little uncomfortable. So you just have to make it comfortable. And I think we're seeing that trend and that opportunity um, you know, show itself. And I think if more people can model that behavior, the hirees, um, you see more hires, you see Popovich, you know, making a stance. And I think that's something that um, would catch on and, and you hope that that trend moves upward. Sir, Tina, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I think that, you know, right now, obviously you're looking at a lot of WNBA players once they finish their careers, they're looking to get into coaching and they really are branching out and looking at the NBA as well as college opportunities. And a lot of WNBA players are assistant coaches and they're choosing potentially not to go overseas, but to go into the coaching field, which I think is great. Um, but I agree, it has to be you know, a desire to do that. And certainly right now, the people that are stepping out and doing those types of, have those types of desires are the WNBA players. So I think it's great. And certainly I wanna see where it goes. Um, you know, from a coaching perspective, um, there have been a lot of coaches that really enjoy coaching on the women's side. Um, you know, the work-life balance certainly, um, you know, keeping that. So, 
when you look at the professional ranks, going to the college ranks, I, I think that right now it's more the professional players who are taking that big step and getting into the men's side of coaching. But eventually I think people will take that, that next step and, and go from the college ranks and go into the professional ranks and vice versa. So I think it's great and I think it's a, a good first step. Awesome. So let's talk a little bit about the differences in coaching men and coaching women. I mean, obviously the recruiting process is probably a little bit different on the women's side than the men's side, specifically to college. Um, so, you know, what do you think are some of the differences, Jonas, maybe you can take this one, um, in coaching men and versus women? I started my career coaching on the men's side, and so uh, my knowledge of that years ago was uh, in the recruiting process, I would say the one thing that I think men um, want to look at is their dreams to play in the NBA, and I think it goes back to what Molly said about they've grown up with that their whole life. And so they look at how can I take this next step to move forward in, in my career, uh, where coaching now on the female side, I think it becomes more about <coughs> Uh, comfortable and family and where am I going to be successful uh, in life and having people uh, surround me that are going to help me do that. Um, that said, the recruiting aspect is one piece that's the coaching basketball piece is exactly the same. You coach men the same way you coach women. Uh, going back to uh, what we were talking about earlier, there are women CEOs, there's women running our country, there's uh, women all over the place. So the opportunities for women to coach basketball should be there. And a lot of, I think, of it is I think the NBA's made a great stance moving forward and opening up those opportunities. I think men's college basketball is a little more stubborn to things, and I think that eventually that needs to happen as well. But if you can lead people and teach people, it doesn't matter your gender. You're, you should be able to be able to be put in those positions. Great. So let's talk a little bit about chemistry on, you know, team chemistry, how does, that, how does that differ when you're coaching men versus women? Forget like the X and O's, forget the recruiting piece, but just, you know, I mean, you mentioned leadership. Of course, that's important. <laughs> you can't win without a good leader. But, um, but you know, what are some of the differences team-wise, culture-wise that you see in, that are different? Well, I, the, I, the biggest thing that I've noticed in coaching co from men to women is that on the men's side, um, it wasn't as fun to travel with them sometimes because they're all about themselves. And how can I do my thing? Um, and it's just a, a men, men's role. But I do think the successful men's programs build a culture and a team and based upon family. I think on the women's side, the same thing is true. I think that successful teams build culture and family. So I think whatever building that chemistry is together to make a group of people go in one direction is how it works. And I think it, it becomes even more important on the women's side to build that to be successful yeah. uh, than it does sometimes on the men's side. And I think, you know, chemistry-wise, when you look at the women's side, it's more honestly about the bonding that goes on both on and off the court. Women are looking for the opportunity to be on the same plane. They like the opportunity to feel equal all the way across, all the teammates. And on the men's side, uh, you know, chemistry-wise, it, it ends up being, and some people might call that a, like a social cohesiveness, but on the, the men's side, there's really a pecking order. Um, a lot of times it's more of a, a task cohesiveness where they're looking at who the best players are and chemistry-wise and how can they get to winning programs. And the women's side, there's that element as well. They're on both sides, and that's why it is similar, but I think the, the order, the priority of that is really different. On the women's side, the bonding is, is extremely important, and the winning is important as well. But I think bonding overall is something that they're looking for team bonding opportunities, you know, team activities that they can participate in and feel good about. And you either have team, good team chemistry or can also go the opposite direction where, you know, things can become a lot of drama, um, issues on your team. And so you're going to have to handle those and you're going to have to do the best you possibly can do to get everyone back on that same plane, on that same page uh, to make your team extremely successful. On the men's side, um, I get the feeling that a lot of times, even if the men are not necessarily getting along, they're still going to get the best player of the ball. They're still going to set that great screen. They're still going to, you know, they want to win. And so the task-oriented type of thing um, maybe is a little bit more prevalent from that standpoint. But they go hand in hand. There's, there's definitely that, that social element of being a great teammate and having that special bond. And there's also that element for both sides of wanting to win and completing your task and, and doing very well. Yeah, I mean, to piggyback on that, I think in a general stance, kids are kids. Um, and at that age, I think the college years are kind of the informidable years of their lives, regardless of gender. And so it's our duty as mentors and leaders who they are around the majority of the time 
to lead them and, and mentor them. So I think regardless of who you're coaching, that relationship has to be less transactional. I give you a scholarship, you go perform on the basketball court and more relationship building and uh, it, it goes deeper than basketball. And I think that's how you're gonna get the best out of your team. I mean, when I was a player, I wanted to play for my coach because I knew she cared about me or I knew he cared about me. So I think regardless, if you wanna get the most out of your team, men or women, you've gotta make sure it's more than a, I'm coaching you because I need this from you. Uh, no, I'm gonna take care of you off, off the court and outside. Uh, these basketball walls or this locker room. And I think that's an important uh, thing to remember as we coach. Great. Do you see a difference um, in coaching men and women with, with the development piece? You know, like maybe the evaluation piece, start at the recruiting, you know, when you're, when you're watching a player, you know, maybe when they're a sophomore in high school. Is there a difference um, between, you know, men's basketball and women's basketball as far as recruiting goes? And if you can identify that talent early and develop it versus that person's ranked in the top 20, and maybe that's their, you know, max potential that they've already, you know, exceeded. How do you, how do you balance that coaching back and forth from men to women? Well, I think women? that, you know, you're always looking to develop players. I don't, it doesn't matter what side you're on, the men's or the women's side. But certainly, um, you know, with the AAU circuit that's been happening, a lot of players are playing more games. Um, and you're looking at, you know, their developmental skills, their fundamental skills and how, how are they getting better? And so it's really big on a staff, whether you're an assistant coach or a head coach, that you develop those skills, that skill set. And so on the men's side, I think that you know, men tend to uh, play a lot more pickup and, and obviously you know, work on their games and they're in the gym a lot. Um, with the college atmosphere as it is right now, you have 20 hours a week that you can work with them. And, and obviously there are even more restrictions during uh, the fall period. Uh, as far as skill sets, but you're really trying to teach fundamentals and you're trying to look at their athleticism and what fits your program. And, and then you look at the, the potential that a student athlete has. And then once you bring them into your program, yes, you're working on skill sets. Again, it doesn't matter if it's on the male side or the female side, you're trying to improve their abilities to make them the best player they possibly can be. So every recruiter that goes out, whether it's men or women, you're looking at what is their skill set currently? How can I improve that skill set? And how does that fit into my system? And so when you're looking at the development of the student athlete, when you're recruiting them, you're looking at all three of those phases to help you to get to the finished product. And, and as they said, there's more to coaching than just basketball now. You're preparing them for life. So everything you do is in preparation of making them a better player. Um, and we're talking about skill development right now. But it really comes down to them wanting to be a better player and then you teaching those fundamental skill sets. Jonas, <laughs> you haven't talked in a while. <laughs> I, I don't, I don't uh, as far as develop, developing players and skill development, there's, uh, there's not a difference. You're, we're, um, as Tina said, we're all developing players and trying to make them better uh, in the skill set. I think uh, as you go, one thing that I think she said was important is, and this is true in life, of just people is uh, a lot of times you're not ready to gain a skill until you, it's absolutely necessary. And so I think once someone finds out that, you know, it, it's affecting playing time or it's affecting my, my abilities, then they work at it even more. But our job is to develop players, men or women, uh, in basketball and in life. And so how can we do that successfully and, and be there for them? So, yeah. So a follow-up to that, Jonas, um, as a male coaching women, um, tell me kind of about your experience. You don't have to you know, use specific examples or names, but how do you go about like, the mental health issue in today's student-athlete world, right? They have so much going on. There's so, there's so much pressure to get their, gra you know, get their grades and um, make sure they're eligible, make sure they're you know, being actually a student-athlete and doing more you know, than just playing basketball. So what, how do you... Um, feel like, do you feel like the women are comfortable coming to you as a male if they have issues, you know, if they have issues with their boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever it happens to be, do you feel like they, uh, tell me a little bit I, the difference I, between I, you I, and I some sure of the women so. assistants. Yeah, yeah, I know, well, and I sure hope so. I think that obviously, um, as, a, as you have as a staff, certain players are more comfortable talking with certain things about other people on the staff, but uh, my door's always open, as well as every staff I've been on. Uh, our coaching staff's door's been open. So, yeah, you have to have those, be able to have those conversations with your student athletes. And, you know, it's like being a parent, you know. You can't be afraid to ask them about their boyfriend or what they're doing on the weekends. And, uh, and 
uh, mentoring them to make good decisions and uh, helping them make good decisions. You know, when you recruit a student athlete, you're telling the parents, we're gonna take care of your daughter for the next four years. And so part of our job is to, a huge part of our job is to mentor them and help them make the right decisions as people and put themselves in the position to be successful. So yeah, I've had many of conversation of kids either having tears or uh, having uh, things that have come up that have been issues and how we deal with them and moving forward. And so uh, those things are all great growing opportunities uh, for student athletes. Great. Do you all have anything to add to the, the mental health you know, issue in our, in our country right now, much less, I mean, our, women's basketball, much less our country. You know, there are a lot of, a lot of student athletes, you know, the pressures and the social media and you know, making sure that they're in the right frame of mind and making sure that you've got that under control. How do you manage that? Um, I think the biggest thing is to help them with their coping skills. You know, if they haven't done well on a test or an exam and they're really down and they're upset. I mean, especially on the, the female side, it, it's difficult. And I think on the male side as well, they, they get down. They, they really do. And they, they're very hard on themselves. And so I think you have to be uplifting. You have to be positive And you have to explain to them that it, there's a new day just around the corner and you have an opportunity to improve whether it's a test that you've done poorly on or whether it's a performance that you haven't performed as well as you'd like to perform. Um, I think so much emphasis is put on competition and success and you know everybody is striving to be the best that they can be. But let's face it, no one's perfect. And student athletes aren't, coaches aren't, administrators aren't. We all make mistakes. And so learning to deal with that, the coping skills, talking to them about you know being able to, to move on and, and to really strive to continue to do their best, their very best. Um, and I think that's one of the things that the open door policy that, that he was mentioning, I think is extremely important. And when they come in, help them cope. And, and that's what we try to do when the student athletes come into our offices. Tina, you're exactly right, because we coach perfectionists, right? And they, they're always striving to be better and do better. And so you just have to have kind of that open platform of, hey, I'm here for you, whatever you need. The B plus on that science test is not the end of the world. Um, so I think that's important just to have that open line of communication. I often take my kids off campus and talk. And something I, I ask them a lot is, tell me something I don't know about you. And it just opens up the door, good, bad, and different, but it just opens up just some conversation and getting to know your players. So they just are, there's that comfortability factor um, when you talk about family, and, and we preach family in our program all the time. And you can't really preach it unless you're actually getting to know them. We recruited them more than just basketball players, we recruited them as, as people and what that comes with in life. Great. So let's switch gears just a little bit and talk, uh, talk about kind of the state of Hi, the hiring process and, um, and becoming a head coach and some of the trends we're seeing and, um, you know, and actually, you know, the firing as well. So we've had, uh, there was a study done by athletic director U recently and that they found um, that the rate at which basketball coaches are fired is higher on the women's side than on the men's, which kind of surprised me a little bit because you always, you know, I guess you just hear all the chatter of, oh, this person got fired on the men's side and, you know, who's going to get that coach coaching job just because some of the fans may be, you know, just on Twitter or whatever, learning about that, trying to figure out who's going to get the next job. Um, but on the women's side, you know, they they discovered it was much higher. And then, in fact, minority women in particular are six times more likely to get fired and than to get a new job. So I thought that was really surprising as well. Um, have you all thought about that much? I mean, is that something that that is, it is kind of a, a thing in women's basketball? Are people talking about it? I think as a personally as a head coach, it's my responsibility, just as in the corporate world. If, if your people move up, that's a feather in your cap. And so we've got to prepare our assistants for the life of a head coach. So um, my assist assistants dabble in a little bit of everything. You know, they, they don't just wear the hat of a recruiting coordinator or the academic liaison. Um, they, they do it all, so they are prepared because I want them to develop and reach their goal potentially someday as a head coach. So hopefully you're preparing them so you, you see those numbers um, decrease in, in the firings. And I think it's so important just to develop um, our assistants to, to be head coaches and be successful. So we can't pigeonhole them, and I think that's super important. I think the, the hiring and firing process, um, you know, right now with the hiring process, so many things come down to fit. You know, that's the word that's being used over and over again. Um, a lot of my peers, um, younger assistant coaches as well as veteran coaches who are looking for that next job, they're talking about fit. What is the administration? What are they looking for? 
And you know, um, we have a, a talking about my peers. They basically feel that if I'm not the right fit, when am I going to be the right fit? And so, fit is such a broad term, um, and I think that that's the the standard um, line right now. But I I prefer to think of it as what are your qualifications? And as what Molly was saying, you're trying to prepare your assistant coaches to become head coaches, and you want them to not only just be the guard coach. You don't want them just to be you know the recruiter. You know you've got to as a head coach. I think that's part of your responsibility is to make sure they're coaching the guards, make sure they're they're at the forward end and coaching the forwards as well, and then give them opportunity to do end of game situations in your practice. Practices, give them an opportunity to go to a radio show or to do some type of panel. Um, that's only going to strengthen their, their opportunity to become a head coach. And in the interviewing process, they want to know what your qualifications are. So uh, I think the big thing right now is that people are a little confused about is what is the fit? Because um, every institution is different and every athletic director is different. They may be looking for a male coach. They may be looking for a female coach. They may be looking for someone who is married or who's single. I mean, there's so many different categories that athletic directors are looking for. So really, um, for me, it comes down to qualifications. And as a head coach, it's your job to help these assistant coaches really fulfill their dreams and help them to become a head coach. What advice would you give to an athletic director? Um, you know, how, how do you evaluate if an assistant is ready? Well, I mean, uh, again, you have to really, as an athletic director, really go to a lot of different sources. Um, I think that you know, when you're looking at, talk to a lot of other head coaches. Look at the conference that they're in and see if they respect that assistant coach from a different institution. If you're considering them for the head coaching position at your institution, you know, ask those other head coaches, do you see them on the road? Are they really diligent about the recruiting aspect of it? Are they committed to their job? You know, do you see them, um, you know, doing the right things away from, you know, particularly the head coach that they're currently working for. And so athletic directors, I'm sure that they're actually looking for a lot of different resources to determine whether someone is ready. But in order to prepare them, you really do need to go to the practices. You really do need to see if your assistant coaches are being trained and if they're really, you know, excelling at the things that I just mentioned. Um, I think that's extremely important. Uh, to, to touch on that, I think a huge part of what you said is educating administration and uh, ADs in the hiring process, especially women's basketball. It's just not um, as well known, and I don't think they spend as much time in that process of, of uh, evaluating uh, talent and coaches coming up. And it's not just assistants getting a head job, it's uh, head coaches from a mid-major going to BCS fit. Um, and so I think that as we can educate more uh, administrators and athletic directors, uh, and I think a, a part of it is that uh, in a certain job, they go for a, a certain profile more than they do the uh, correct person for the job as far as being ready for the job. And as you said, fit. Uh, it's more high, higher than sometimes for profile. Uh, and so the more that we can hire the right people uh, that are ready and trained for those positions, then there will be less people getting fired. Um, but the, the trend of women's basketball has to, been to hire a profile um, and they're not ready for that position, and then they get thrown to the wolves, and then they end up getting fired. Um, and so I think the more we can train administrators and athletic directors as far as hiring the right people um, and then training from there to move forward, it would be a huge movement for women's basketball, actually. Anything to add to that, Molly? I agree completely <laughs> with both of them. Very well said, both of you. Um, so our, Let's talk a little bit about mentoring some of the younger women's assistant coaches that happen to be women. How do we do that? I mean, you mentioned giving them more responsibility, you know, radio shows, letting them go do more. Um, what, what else can we be doing? I mean, as a, as a, as a person that's a search consultant, um, I love spending my time going to different clinics and coaching clinics and, you know, Final Four and, uh, you know, things, things like NACTA where we're going to meet, you know, some more administrators and then also coaches. Um, you know, I always tell coaches, you have to be known to be needed, right? So it's both ways. So, you know, I can go out and know all these coaches. And every time we go to a campus, I try to spend time with, you know, women's basketball coaches, fencing coaches, like I mentioned, tennis coaches, whoever it might be, helping them with professional development with some, with some of our clients. But, you know, it goes both ways. You know, I think I would, I would challenge all the, the young um, up-and-coming assistant coaches to get to know all the search firms because I feel like there is a trend going um, in the direction of athletic churches do want to get the hires right, and sometimes they might not have that network, and maybe they've been at the same school for a long time. They don't know a lot of 
women's coaches or tennis coaches or softball coaches or whatever it may be. So they're relying heavily on us to just not to pick who wins, but to bring great slate of candidates. And they might have a you know a couple of people they've worked with before, someone that one of their peer friends had recommended, and um, you know being able to just expand their network. And you know this is what we do for a living. So if we can say, hey, here are ten people you might not have thought of. Um, but it goes both ways. So I would challenge every uh, assistant coach in the country to get to know, you know, their own administration because that's who's going to recommend them for a job. You know, the, the people I call aren't aren't really coaches as much as, hey, administrators, and who do you like? Who's worked for, for you that you like? And if they have done that radio show, they're going to know who they are. And, you know, go to lunch with your compliance person. Go to lunch with your SWA or whoever it may be. Get to know. Get out of your box. Get out of your gym and your film room. Um, so would you all agree, have you encouraged some of your assistant coaches and have you been encouraged to do that as uh, well, Jarvis? Absolutely. And you want to get to know as, and network as, as many people as you can. And I think uh, it goes from at one point you are networking with a lot of head coaches potentially to move assistant jobs and that, those type of things. One other thing I would say is I think it's great to have different bases of background and not get stuck in one, one role in one uh, situation. And then from there getting to know as many athletic directors. And I agree with you. I think. Uh, as the trend is moving forward, there's a lot more search firm involvement in hiring women's basketball coaches. I, I think something that may help the situation also is to just have search firms maybe go to Final Fours and be there and be available to the assistant coaches and have a round table for the assistant coaches so they can meet the search firms because they honestly don't know who the search firms are. And then as a head coach, being able to help your assistant coaches learn who the search firms are, but also you know, be willing to open up um, and talk about you know, the strategies of the game and um, helping them as grow as just coaches in general, you know, end of game situations and why you made the decision you made at the, you know, the five minute mark of the third quarter or the end of a quarter. And, you know, I don't think there's enough discussion necessarily as to head coaches talking to their assistant coaches and preparing them for those strategies. Because as we talk about being thrown into the fire, when the game's on the line and there's, you know, 10 seconds left, what player are you going to call? And a lot of times the assistant coaches don't have the reasoning behind that. And if the head coach can share, whether you fail or whether you succeed, if you share the reason why you're doing something with the assistant coaches, that'll help them to start think about what they would do um, in that situation when they're a head coach. Excellent. We're on the same wavelength. I mean, sometimes it's not what you know, it's who you know, right? right? And who recommends you? 87% yeah. of jobs are placed off of one reference. That could be an AD for you. That could be another coach that worked with the athletic director that they trust. And so it's all about trust. And, and it's, you know, it's not that we don't want to know who these great assistant coaches are. We just, you know, they haven't been recommended because they aren't out of their own film room. So, um, well, I will leave it at that. We are out of time today, but I appreciate everyone uh, being here. And it's been really great talking to all of you. And um, thanks a lot.